smooth start. <laughs> um, all right, you saw this one already. Let's see how this goes. Oh, no, that's not going to work. Oh, no, I'll just use this. This is fine. Okay. Okay, that's me. That's me on my first mushroom hunt. That's uh, Butrobolitis appendectylatus, the butter bolete. It's a very delicious edible. Anyhow, my first mushroom hunt changed my life. And uh, as this uh, quote says, everyone knows what it means to go viral, but what does it mean to go fungal? And so after my first mushroom hunt, I had the benefit of learning from someone who had been mu hunting mushrooms for uh, 16 years at that time. And he recommended two books to me, uh, Mushrooms Demystified and Mycelium Running. So I promptly went out and got those books and then started teaching myself everything I could, learning to ID mushrooms and cultivate mushrooms and uh, adding new mushrooms to my repertoire every year. And I decided that the best thing that I could do to lessen my impact on the earth was to become a farmer and grow my own food. So I moved to Nepal and started an organic farm and a yoga retreat with my wife, Devika. And she does the yoga, I do the food and uh, learned to cultivate mushrooms there uh, in, in large amounts. And uh, this is actually quite a long story. I, 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 I did a, a sort of a fungal origin story about myself on YouTube called Gone Fungal. If you wanna watch that, that gets into all the details and all the twists and turns. Um, but I just wanna bring you up to date on how I got into medicinal mushrooms. So after the earthquake in Nepal, uh, I ended up uh, moving back to Colorado. We're good? Oh. Talking. And uh, I moved back in with my 96 year old grandfather who was losing his mind. And, you know, medicinal mushrooms had already been on my radar for some time. And I started reading more about nootropic mushrooms, particularly lion's mane and uh, psilocybe genus. And unfortunately for my grandfather, it was too little too late. Uh, and he died at 99 and a half years old. But this really got me down the medicinal mushroom rabbit hole, as they say. And um, I had been basically uh, eating lots and lots of uh, medicinal mushroom extracts uh, and stopped getting sick. And then I started feeding them to my family and they stopped getting sick. And at this time we lived in a household of um, six, six people, some children, uh, four generations. So, you know, flu season was like a real thing. And then I discovered that actually flu season is just kind of the perfect storm of cold weather, too much sugar, too much alcohol and too much closeness with other people. And the mushrooms really, to prove to me and my family that, you know, this can be avoided quite easily. And I have a background in documentary filmmaking. So I spent my entire career making films and doing documentaries. And so I started documenting uh, like my healing process, my family's healing process, and my friends and my community's healing process. And in this way, I was able to collect a lot of uh, sort of case study anecdotal data about, you know, what people were using, why they were using it, and how uh, it was working for them or not working for them. And so, to be fair, I am not a doctor. You know, I'm self-taught. I've had a lot of fantastic mentors, and um, I've had the privilege of the confidence of the people that I work with. And so that's where a lot of my data and research comes from. After um, some time, uh, because of my reputation as a mushroom guy, 
uh, I started sourcing medicinal mushrooms for other brands and uh, you know, using them on myself in particular, but leveraging my reputation in order to get people the best possible medicine that they could find. And so a lot of what I'm gonna talk about tonight is from this inside industry perspective. And I want you to consider this really just like a jumping off point for you to do your own learning. Uh, I was thinking about this just the other day, this, the word research. And everyone says, oh, do your own research. And it occurred to me that I, I like this idea because you search as we do search for mushrooms and maybe you don't find them, but then you research because you really want to find them. <laughs> And, I, and this, this idea, this sort of play on words resonated with me. And I realized that when you really want to learn something, you do the reading. And you talk to the people who know much more about it than you do. And you get the hands-on experience. And ultimately, that leads to authentic real-life experience. All right, let's see. Now, the switcher is not working. arrow keys. Oh, oh, he just touched the screen. All right, okay. that works. Okay. So uh, can we move that up? Yes, we can. Look at that. Okay, never mind. We're good. We're good. So these are four of the main books that I use regularly. I use a lot more than these uh, mush mushroom books that focus on specific mushrooms, but Christopher Hobbs and uh, Robert Dale Rogers are my book mentors. And I've had the privilege to speak to them on a number of occasions, and it's been wonderful to learn from them. They're both herbalists and have a background in medicinal mycology. And um, so in Ro Robert's work is, he, he creates books that are sort of amalgamations of research papers that then he digests and uh, um, simplifies. So like, you know, you can understand an entire paper in one paragraph. And so all of these books are um, collections of research papers that he's digested and then communicated in a more clear way. And, uh, and it's amazing to, to consider like basically when I started doing my own reading of research papers, I had to learn a new language. I'm constantly looking up words to find out what things mean because scientific papers are written in uh, scientific language, which is difficult to understand. And so it's a slow process, not, to under, not only to find which papers to read, but also to understand what they're actually saying. And so there's about, up to now and probably more than 4,500 research studies and counting done on medicinal mushrooms. And the vast majority of those papers are done on the fruit bodies. Uh, and so as I, as I sort of got deeper and deeper into mushrooms, I started making movies about the people that were using medicinal mushrooms to heal themselves or to treat their conditions or to find relief after an injury or some such thing. And so this is also where a lot of my data is collected. And then of course, the lived experience, which is often overlooked in science. And um, it's my opinion that lived experience should not be overlooked, that each of us as individuals our experiences are authentic and legitimate and should be considered in the greater body of data that we use to understand our world and our healing processes. Fungi are masters of evolution. With a history spanning at least 900 million years, fungi have successfully adapted to almost every habitat on earth. Conservative estimates place global fungal diversity beyond that of land plants by a ratio of 10 to one. And I think the ratio is flipped for botanists to mycologists. You know, for every 10 botanists, there's one mycologist. While there remains some uncertainty regarding the exact number of fungal species that exist, it is clear that fungi have been afforded a unique evolutionary and environmental fitness. 
Fungi owe this inherent ability to survive to their extensive repertoire of natural product pathways. Many of the natural products from these pathways have antimicrobial, antifungal, immunosuppressive, and cytotoxic effects. These bioactive properties enable fungi to successfully take hold of an ecological niche by conferring the ability to compete for nutrients, to deter predators, and to communicate with other organisms in the environment. These same fungal bioactive compounds can also be harnessed by humans to produce valuable medicines, such as antimicrobial, anti-cancer, antiviral agents, natural product pathways, pathway discovery, and engineering from fungi therefore holds great promise for the pharmaceutical industry. This sums it up right here. We have unique, uh, fungi have a unique relationship with the earth and we're just kind of along for the ride. Speaking specifically about medicinal mushrooms, uh, it's my philosophy and, and other um, medicinal mycologists uh, that truly the first medicine is going out to hunt for mushrooms or whatever medicine you may be looking for. That walking and breathing, connecting with nature, seeking your medicine, um, actively participating in your own wellness. Uh, these are critical components to getting better, whatever your ailment may be. And in that way, as mushroom hunters, there's this philosophy that I've adopted, which is that there's a difference between mushroom hunting and mushroom collecting. And that's the level of expectation that you have when you're going out into the forest, into the mountain, into the meadow, that it's still a practice that I have to do to lower my expectations, that I'm going out there to walk and breathe and engage with my environment first, and hopefully find some mushrooms in particular, the ones that I'm So this is something that really needs to be considered that's again, overlooked in the science that the mountain provides what you need. That sometimes you might be looking for a particular medicine, but actually what you find is the medicine you need. And in this way we have, you know, they, fungi have integrated themselves into every aspect of our life. Like we would not <gasps> be here without them. And even, even in terms of how they plug into our serotonin receptors. Oh. Getting some weird sounds coming from the computer. Sounds like someone's burping on the other end. Um, uh, I mean, just, just the fact that, you know, they're integral to our ecosystems, they're integral to our inner micro. Got it. All right. Is that our first? Oh, nope. Hey, whoa. Nope. Oh, boy, we're going forward. No, 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 no. Go. Yes. Oh, now we're going the other way. Let's go back. Back to the beta glucans. I wanted to use my computer. I... <laughs> no worries. No worries. Uh, there we go. Here okay. We go. So it's page up, page down here. Right. Yep. Okay. Okay. Now we'll get into the nitty gritty. So one of the only things that the medicinal mushroom community can agree on are how effective fungal beta glucans are. 
then they work in two primary mechanisms. They are anti-inflammatory and immunomodulating. And between these two mechanisms, they can treat so many of our chronic conditions. Truly, like most of what we suffer comes from these two problems. And uh, so even if you're not sick, like even if you wanna just try using medicinal mushrooms, um, they will help you feel better in ways that you can't anticipate. Because you already have your baseline of wellness right now as you sit there, you understand how you feel. You are intimately aware of your body and how you feel day to day. And what happens when you start taking anti-inflammatories and immunomodulators is that you start to feel lighter on your feet. You start to sleep better. You, you're, the cold that you catch is just less, less of a cold. And there's just numerous examples of how these two mechanisms can just generally raise the wellness of our, of our baseline. Um, the fungal beta glucans are found in the chitin, which is the cell wall of the mushroom. As you know, mushrooms can be very tough on the outside. Uh, you know, we have a number of tough polypores in Colorado, Fomatopsis schrenkii, Ganoderma aplanatum, but even the softer mushrooms like uh, Comatus coprinus, the shaggy mane, these have the ability to break through asphalt and push up rocks. And that strength comes from the chitin. Now chitin on its own is indigestible. Uh, it's the same stuff that exoskeletons are made out of in insects and seashells and that kind of thing. Uh, and so in order to access those beneficial beta-glucans, you have to break the cell wall. And the way we do that is by um, cooking, um, like pressure cooking with water or alcohol. And of course, drying helps that process along as well. Um, the primary uh, beta-glucans that people are interested in are 1,3 and 1,6. And uh, these are basically just beneficial sugars. And so when you get, uh, you know, like uh, um, a mushroom extract will often be sweet. And I'll talk more about that later and what some red flags are around that flavoring. But these are soluble fibers. And that's really important because uh, the fibers are the, um, basically they're prebiotic. So they help you digest everything and absorb nutrients from what you're consuming. And this is really fundamental in most people, like this is the best prebiotic fiber you can get in your diet, especially uh, for people that like hardcore meat eaters or people that don't eat enough vegetables like eating more mushrooms can really affect your general health, even just gourmet and wild mushrooms because of these soluble prebiotic fibers. Uh, one of the most interesting things about the fungal beta-glucans is they act as hormone regulators, which uh, I use primarily, like this is the thing that I feel the most every day because I put my mushroom extracts in my coffee and that regulates the cortisol spike that the caffeine would give me. So I have a coffee experience that doesn't have a come up or a come down and there's no jitters. And now I can't go back to coffee without mushrooms. And that you know, touches on and explains a little bit about why mushroom coffee is so damn popular now, that it actually creates a better coffee experience without disrupting the flavor in any significant way. Um, ergosterol, I'm going to, I'm going to go through these next few slides fairly quickly. Uh, this is fascinating, uh, compound that's, uh, found in mushrooms. It comes from ergot. Uh, it was named for it. It's a sulfur containing amino acid. This is the stuff that converts the, um, ergosterol, ergosterol, excuse me, ergosterol converts to vitamin D. D2 in sunlight. This is really important because people, there's a lot of talk about 
how important the vitamin D2 is and how most of us are deficient in it. Um, ergosterol crosses the blood brain barrier. Uh, this is found in the most concentrations in white button mushrooms, Agaricus bisporus, in the third flush, which I find so random and interesting. It's also in very high concentrations in oyster and shiitake. It's a powerful antioxidant and fundamentally it protects our cell mitochondria. Mitochondria are the powerhouse of our cells. That means they, they basically create the electricity that then runs the cell and then powers our whole body. So you can imagine how much benefit can come from that simple mechanism. Vitamin D2. Uh, so this is what ergo is converted into. Uh, most people are deficient. Uh, this helps the body absorb and use calcium and phosphate. So a number of benefits from vitamin D2. This is a giant um, porcini I found. This is what I call mountain loaf. I put this photo up here because porcini contains 35 micrograms per 100 grams of vitamin D2, which is one of the highest levels of vitamin D2. Now, 35 micrograms is not a lot, but it's a lot compared to all the other mushrooms. <laughs> All right, triterpenes. These are aromatic compounds along with diterpenes. Um, I found this graphic online, which helps illustrate basically how crazy these compounds are. Um, there are many, many variations of this compound. Um, the way that I experience the triterpenes for the most part is how uh, they relax me because they affect our parasympathetic nervous system. So uh, reishi, Ganoderma lucidum, lingshur, Szechuanensis, these mushrooms, uh, as well as our uh, Ganoderma aplanatum, the, the artist conch, contain fairly high amounts of triterpenes. And that's what we're going after when we do an alcohol extraction. Um, so tinctures of these mushrooms are going to be more beneficial than tinctures of other mushrooms, for example, like cordyceps, which I'll get into later. Uh, so, I mean, you've probably seen a bunch of reishi products out there that say like calm or soothing, or, you know, they're trying to use these words that aren't um, gonna be red flagged by the FDA. And that's why it's because of these triterpenes that help relax you and improve your sleep down. Uh oh. This is just uh, one short list of the triterpenes found in Ganoderma lucidum in the spores only. So this is just to illustrate that there are so many of these. There, there's thousands probably, and we probably only know a few hundred at best. So diterpenes, it's all about the terps. You may have heard that in the cannabis industry. And it's true for functional and medicinal mushrooms as well. So this is a lion's mane, Hericea marinaceus. Uh, this is the one uh, that's most famous for its diterpenes, which are in particular the aranacines and the hericinones. So these are um, fat, soluble com aromatic compounds and the way like if you're if you're getting an extract that's cooked too hot you're destroying those beneficial compounds and so it's critical that you're doing uh, low temp water extracts and alcohol extracts on this mushroom or the mycelium which i'll get into later um, but the aranacines are the nootropic compounds that you know, promote neuroplasticity, neurogenesis, they have the nerve growth factor, um, they prevent and destroy amyloid plaque. And that's why this mushroom and the, the medicines around this mushroom are so popular right now. This is the top selling mushroom uh, and mushroom extract across the board globally. It's crazy, particularly, uh, sorry, it's not the top selling mushroom globally, it's the top selling mushroom in the West. And it's because everybody thinks they're going to get smarter and 
their brains are going to work longer if they eat a lot of this mushroom or use these extracts. Um, and it's important they cross the blood brain barrier. Um, there are more aranaceans. This is where most of the research is on the aranaceans. And these are found in higher concentrations in the mycelium. And the harissinones are found in higher concentrations in the fruit body. And there's some research to show that when the mycelium fruits, those aranaceans are then transferred to the fruit body. So from a cultivation perspective, you can't really have the mycelium and the fruit body if you're going after the aranaceans in your medicine. And this, this is important for later discussion when I talk about products that have that are mycelia, myceliated grain or fruit body products. So as a caveat, one study of amyloid beta plaquing associated with Alzheimer's disease found that when uh, cut open, 70% of them uh, uh, contain the human herpes simplex virus one. This suggests the leaky brain often associated with leaky gut acted to protect itself from viral invasion and form the plaques in defense. As one author noted, it may be amyloid beta is the fireman, not the fire. Surely something to think about going forward into future research, prevention of potential cures needs to be explored. So what this means is that one of the big hypes around lion's mane is that it prevents and destroys amyloid plaque. But what this brings up is why is the plaque there in the first place? This is a degenerative brain disease. And this author argues that the plaque is containing the herpes virus and protecting the brain from that virus. And in so doing also causing this degenerative condition. So very interesting, much more research needs to go into this. And um, this is just to consider that everything you hear about medicinal and functional mushrooms, there's often a caveat to it. Statins, another compound found in mushrooms. Um, lovastatin is the primary compound found. Reishi and oyster have super high concentrations of it. It's primarily used in, in uh, Western medicine as um, a way to lower cholesterol. And uh, I've seen it work with a number of my clients in like shocking ways. Um, the fundamental difference between the statins found in mushrooms and the ones used like the synthesized statins are the safety. So synthesized statin drugs cause inflammation of the liver, which can cause flu-like symptoms. And generally they're quite dangerous that you have to be super careful if you're taking them. Um, whereas the fungal lovastatin is quite safe and won't cause these kinds of side effects. Um, and yeah, so there's about 800 studies that show there are a risk to our health, these synthesized statin drugs. So again, another beneficial compound that's found better, like more safe and better in mushrooms than what the uh, Western uh, medical industrial complex will tell you. So this is a list of all the most, like <laughs> more compounds, more beneficial. I'm not gonna get into all of these, um, but as you can see, there's all kinds of good stuff in there. Um, so let's see, I don't want to talk about all these. Um, it's a lot. It's a lot. Let's just say though, there's lots of good stuff and you should be eating lots of mushrooms. Okay. So common functional mushrooms. Now I put functional in quotations, uh, because uh, the FDA really won't let me say medicinal. That there is still a debate about whether mushrooms are medicinal. And it's kind of crazy to consider that after uh, all the research papers and all the proof pointing to the benefits of medicinal mushrooms. So that's why a lot of the industry uses the word functional. But I also think it's awesome because they improve our function overall. As I was saying before about baseline wellness, like improving your baseline wellness means you're going to improve overall. 
and that just makes us more functional humans. And I so there's another sort of uh, another interpretation of the word that resonates with me. So reishi is one of the most heavily studied mushrooms that we know about. Uh, it comes in many forms. The vast majority of cultivated mushrooms on the planet are Ganoderma lingshur and Szechuanensis. There is some debate around the genetics of lucidum, um, which is a whole other talk you could give on that. Um, reishi truly is like the everything mushroom. It's often touted as the mushroom of immortality, which comes from some old um, traditional Chinese medicine texts. And uh, there's some stories about, you know, it being a rite of passage to go and hunt the mushroom and find it on the mountain and how difficult it is to find. And chewing on it fresh can give you a buzz. Um, this is a fantastic mushroom. It's a beautiful mushroom. In TCM, it's used it, um, primarily around like blood health, heart health, liver health. Um, but as you can see, these are all uh, medical claims that have been verified by research. And I use this mushroom primarily to manage my sugar cravings, um, which might be the result of the candida living in my gut and controlling my cravings. I'm not sure about that, but sometimes it feels like that. I have a number of clients that use this for allergies during our, um, uh, when the cottonwoods start fluffing out and pollinating uh, to, great, to great effect. Uh, I have a number of people that use this for their rheumatoid arthritis. Uh, when someone comes to me and says, oh, I have this problem and which mushroom should I use for it? Uh, and I haven't read any research or I'm not sure which mushroom to suggest, I suggest this one because it works in often miraculous and surprising ways. And I can't explain it, but you know, it does everything has all kinds of benefits for us. And so if you're wondering, oh, which mushroom should I try? Like if there's any one that you're curious about using regularly, I recommend reishi. Turkey tail is also, um, Tremetes or Coriolis versicolor is also a very heavily studied medicinal and functional mushroom. Um, there's, it's again, similar to Reishi and that it's used for all kinds of things. Um, one of the most interesting things about turkey tail, in my opinion, is that there have been two um, compounds patented in Japan that are derived from turkey tail mycelium called polysaccharide peptide and polysaccharide crestin, uh, PSP and PSK. And now these have become uh, like regularly prescribed adjunct therapies to chemo and radiation. So if you're getting cancer treatments in Japan, you're also getting these, this PSP and PSK to help you survive these intense medications like radiation and chemotherapy. And one red flag with turkey tail, and this is true for reishi as well, is that when you're taking like cancer sized doses of this, it can thin your blood. So one of the few contraindications is with uh, blood thinners. If you're already taking them, you shouldn't be taking massive amounts of turkey tail or reishi. And when I say like cancer sized treatment, that's like the most that I've ever seen reported or prescribed, which is depending on the potency of the extract is anywhere between three and 10 grams of extract a day, which comes out to be like 12 to 20 grams of whole dried fruit body, which is like a lot of mushrooms every day. Um, so chaga, another very famous ancient medicinal functional mushroom. However, what we use is the sclerotia of the chaga, which is this mass we see on the exterior of the birch tree and some other species of tree, but primarily birch. Um, this mushroom, again, has been used for centuries, probably millennia across uh, Eastern Europe and Russia, across Siberia, uh, 
almost all of the commercial chaga in the world now comes from Siberia because they have a network of foragers that can collect enough to supply the demand. Um, among all of these amazing things that it does, one of the most interesting things for me, like what stands this mushroom apart for me is the melanin, uh, which is very good for the skin and the hair. It protects us from UV radiation. Uh, there is a Japanese paper that came out a couple years ago that looked at a triterpene in a, a lano, lano stain type of triterpene found in chaga that's five times more effective than minoxidil, which is the active ingredient found in Rogaine and Keeps, which are the men's hair regrowth medicines. And so the research was prompted by um, the, the reports from Mongolia that um, Mongolians used it to treat their hair and their baldness. And lo and behold, it works five times better than what's uh, you know, available in the Western medicine market. There is quite a lot of debate around chaga and its sustainability. Um, because it is a pathogen to the tree, um, there's rumors about people like cutting trees down in order to harvest one sclerotia. Um, but any sustainable harvester knows that is um, relying on this kind of thing for their income knows that you keep your sources alive as best you can. So I don't believe those rumors about um, cutting trees down. However, the world consumes so much chaga that we may not have it for much longer. And this is interesting and a complicated debate within um, this particular section of mycology. Um, it can be cultivated uh, however, it's missing the betulinic acid, which, which is one of the beneficial compounds that's found within. So you can grow it on birch, but for some reason it doesn't have all the qualities that a wild harvested one would have. Um, so, you know, for me, I bathe in my chaga now. I put it in the bath and I come out feeling silky and nice. And that's the way I like to take it. Sometimes when I feel called to use it, uh, I'll put it in my coffee, but I basically cycle through all these different mushrooms all the time. And I, and I choose sort of intuitively what I'm gonna use for a week or two at a time, uh, unless I get sick, which still happens from time to time. Cordyceps, Cordyceps militaris. This is a very popular medicinal mushroom. Um, one of the things that makes cordyceps really special is the 3-deoxyadenosine, which is um, an analog to adenosine. And it's actually missing an oxygen molecule, which makes it also an antiviral. And so this stuff, this 3-deoxyadenosine uh, feeds our mitochondria. It increases O2 uptake in the blood. So it's really sold as like an endurance mushroom. And in traditional Chinese medicine, it's used as a sexual tonic and it increases sexual vigor. And I can attest to that, absolutely. You know, after about three days of using this, um, you know, between like two to three grams every day for three days, I'm feeling very frisky. And, you know, it's awesome. It feels like mushroom power. That's what my wife says. Oh, you got mushroom power. I'm like, yeah. So I eat a lot of this one. But I cycle on and off this one as well. Like any supplementing, you should be cycling on and off generally. And that just gives your body a chance to catch up with all the extra compounds. And one of the most interesting things about this mushroom to me is that there was a, a study done on mice where it helped reset their circadian rhythms. So not only does it provide energy from a cellular level, it also improves sleep generally. And, um, and so just to put that into context, like caffeine doesn't make us feel energized. It prevents us from feeling tired. And that's an important distinction. And uh, this is a photo of uh, one of the teas that I make. One of my favorite recipes for cordyceps of the fruit body is I make a hot water extraction. I do a crude tea let it sit for 10 minutes. 
I drink the broth and then I fry the mushrooms up with an egg. And I feel like I'm getting a lot more out of my mushrooms when I do that and I use both sides of it. And they're delicious. They're lovely, delicious mushrooms and they're easily cultivated. Um, and for those of you who don't know, this is an endopathogenic fungi that grows in the US, primarily in the East Coast and some, some in the Midwest. And so it targets insects. And um, the most famous cordyceps, uh, well, until that show came out recently, is uh, Ophiocordyceps sinensis, the caterpillar fungus, also known as Yarsagumba or uh, Yarsagumbu, which is another, um, that's the Tibetan um, pronunciation. This is the Nepali pronunciation. Um, and so this is a wild harvested cordyceps that you will see on the market. It's touted everywhere. And uh, it's super expensive. Uh, I've, you know, I've seen prices up to $30,000 a kg for this. Um, it's been sold for more, I'm sure. It's heavily, heavily harvested. Um, we are actually still learning a lot about this mushroom. There's actually like three different kinds of fungi that come together to par parasitize these caterpillars. These are ghost moth caterpillars. And so we're just really starting to understand what's happening to these caterpillars and the life cycle of the fungi. Um, one of the crazy things is that because they're wild harvested, there's no mechanism of control uh, for the uh, uptake of heavy metals. And so these actually contain quite a lot of arsenic and they're highly, highly prized in Chinese medicine. Um, however, in 2019, a biotechnology company out of China successfully cultivated fruit bodies on caterpillars. And to me, this should be like big, you know, headline news, but it has basically gone uh, unnoticed. Um, and what's happening is this biotechnology company is not advertising this. And they're mixing what they grow into the wild harvested harvests in order to keep those prices high. And the cultivation life cycle takes about 500 days from inoculation to fruit body. So you can understand the economic incentives to keep the prices high. Um, I'll come back to this later, but be wary of any product on the internet uh, that's claiming to be Ophiocordyceps sinensis, because often it's just the mycelium and it's one of those three strains of mycelium and they probably don't even know which one. Lion's mane, did I already talk about this? I went the wrong way. Uh, is there two? Oh, page up. Okay, yeah, Where, did I have two lion's mane slides? Sorry about that, guys. Agaricon, amazing mushroom. Um, heavily touted by fungi perfecti. Um, as the most potent antiviral known to science. But really, it's a true antibiotic. I mean, it's anti-everything, as you can see. Uh, it's very rare and precious. It grows exclusively on old growth dug firs. Uh, this is a specimen that my brother and I found uh, almost six years ago. And I'm still using this mushroom to make extracts, the same fruit body that I'm holding in this photo. Uh, there were two fruit bodies growing on this dead uh, old growth dug fir. And what my brother and I have been doing is trying to induce growth by knocking the tree and creating wounds in the tree to try and, it's a dead tree, to try and activate new fruit body growth just to see what will happen. And so far over six years or so, nothing has happened yet, but this was about, I think it was about a 10 pound mushroom. We're still using the same one to make tinctures. Uh, Garicon became really popular um, for COVID when you know, there were people who 
wanted to use natural antivirals and um, not the vaccine. Uh, Amanita muscaria, most iconic mushroom on the planet. I've had a long journey with this mushroom. It's fascinating, it's beautiful, it's captivating. In some way, it's like really thoroughly penetrated our psyche as a species on this planet because it is the mushroom that comes to mind when somebody says mushroom. Uh, so there's a lot of misinformation about this mushroom, primarily that it's deadly poisonous. That's just patently untrue. If you do eat one fresh, for example, you will have diarrhea and vomiting and feel like shit, and that's not death. Um, you might want to die, but it won't kill you. Um, so we have a lot of these in Colorado. This can be easily processed into a gourmet edible by boiling it and throwing the water out and boiling it again and throwing the water out to be extra careful. And that works because ibotenic acid is water soluble and it's destroyed in the heat. Not destroyed, but it's drawn out of the mushroom in the heat. And so by boiling it, you can literally remove the toxins and then it becomes an amazing, delicious edible. The cap tastes like kind of fatty fish and the stem is kind of like a nutty chicken and it's just perfect. And so the way we use this mushroom is by converting that ibotenic acid into muscimol. And um, this requires a triple conversion. This recipe is actually found in the Rig Veda. And so you dry it to a cracker crisp, then you uh, simmer it for 20 minutes, you remove the material, you keep your tea, and then you ferment the tea with a lactobacillus. So you can use yogurt or kombucha. I use kombucha. And if you keep track of your ratios of like gram weight to liquid volume, then you can, then you can keep track of your dosing. So I make a medicine that's like um, where a tablespoon of this kombucha is a dose. So I start with about 30 grams of dried fruit body, but I'm not gonna get too deep into that. Um, so uh, muscimol crosses the blood brain barrier, which is important. It's a GABA agonist. So it works on the same receptors that alcohol does. Um, it's a really powerful anti-anxiety medicine. I've tested it on a few friends who have debilitating anxiety and literally within minutes of taking a tablespoon of this stuff, they're relaxed and okay. And to me, this is amazing. Um, it really is a great sleep aid, deep, deep sleeps, crazy dreams. Uh, full disclosure, you know, my journey with this mushroom has been for many years and um, I managed to poison myself with it um, by, getting a hot dose. Basically, I used to nibble on the caps when I was mushroom hunting. And I would have these ecstatic, euphoric experiences being guided or led to new mushrooms all over the mountain. And I was called to this one mushroom that was a particularly dark blood red. And I took a tiny sliver of the cap and ate it. Ate it. And like three, four hours later, I was rolling around in pain exploding out of both ends. And then I had like insane fever dreams all night long, you know, like the dark night of the soul kind of experience. And after that, now I approach, approach it with extreme reverence and caution. Don't use this mushroom recreationally anymore. This is truly medicine only for me. And I'm working on a whole film about that. Uh, so, it's also uh, topical pain relief. There's a number of companies out there that use it. Uh, you can buy solves with it, it's highly effective. I have a number of clients that use it to quit drinking, to, to success. So when they get an alcohol craving, they take a tablespoon of the kombucha, a triple conversion, and their craving for the alcohol goes away. 
And if when I used this a, a few years ago, I did an Amanita ceremony on the solstice uh, with some friends. And we ended up using about five tablespoons because we thought that would be a big enough you know, ceremonial dose. And ultimately, you know, it felt like being drunk for the most part. Uh, and didn't really feel it like how strong that dose was until I got home and I was in that familiar environment. When you get home, you're like, oh, well, I'm higher than I thought. And, and then again, I went through this crazy fever dream experience. And I thought maybe using it ceremonially would change that, but that was not the case for me. So proceed with caution. If you decide to create a relationship with this mushroom, um, you know, do it with reverence. Um, that's all I can really say about it. Uh, but it is a powerful and effective medicine for those that need it. Oysters, everyone loves oysters. Um, this is, uh, this is another one I use to manage uh, my sugar cravings. Um, and there's a lot of data to support how it manages our blood sugar and our cholesterol. But the main thing I wanna say about oysters is that there's a ton of research on them and their medicinal, medicinal efficacy for all kinds of things and cancer and like all the big diseases, it, it's so good for us. And I feel like it's one of these like underappreciated mushrooms. And that's why I call it the Empress fungi, that it's an amazing medicinal mushroom. It can be used uh, in all kinds of um, applied mycology, mycoremediation. Um, you can build uh, fungal textiles from it. Uh, you can easily grow it. It eats just about anything you feed it. And in this way, like this is the true like top of the pyramid in the mushroom hierarchy for me. It has so many applications um, and it's like so delicious. And when you find it in nature, it's huge flushes. And so, you know, this is my uh, argument to raise it to the top to push Reishi and Chaga off the, off the throne. Okay, maybe some of you are waiting for me to talk about this one, I don't know. Um, very popular mushroom now, has been for a long time, but even more so as our laws have changed in Colorado. Um, you know, the sad, the sad thing about our culture in the U.S. is that, you know, thanks to um, Richard Nixon, we weren't able to study psychedelics for many decades. And we've lost a lot of ground in that, which is really, really unfortunate. And now, uh, thanks to the Johns Hopkins death study, the door is open again, particularly around psychedelic research and magic mushrooms. Um, so basically, we are now researching psilocybin and psilocin and the other, you know, the entourage effect of the active alkaloids within the psilocybe group um, for everything. I mean, there are so many studies happening right now and all kinds of different dosing protocols and uh, has a number of benefits. The results are coming in slowly, slowly, but it's proving to be highly effective in all kinds of areas, uh, primarily substance abuse, uh, depression. It, it plugs in, new research shows that it plugs into these TPR receptors in our uh, nervous system. Uh, that we found out recently that it's a super powerful anti-inflammatory. Um, the selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors uh, are now being pushed aside thanks to psilocybin um, as a uh, plugging into our serotonin receptors. Serotonin, excuse me. You know what I'm trying to say, serotonergic? <laughs> excuse me. Um, so uh, what's interesting to me is that there's all this official research going on around um, psilocybin and psilocin. However, there are tens of thousands, maybe hundreds of thousands of people right now experimenting on themselves 
all through all over the world with using this mushroom, self-medicating. And you know, the important thing really to understand is that this medicine is not for everyone. The same like any medicine that like, just because you think, oh, I'm gonna start microdosing because I heard it's good for me. Like maybe that's not right for you. And it, it's, you have to be very discerning in this process that like the research isn't gonna tell us everything about it but you will know better than anyone else whether or not it's working for you and helping you and whatever you're using it to treat. And, you know, I've heard about people using it for so many different things. Uh, one of the most interesting things uh, is around um, like PMS symptoms uh, for women that finding immense relief using it with these symptoms, uh, which to me is like one of the most, seems like one of the most practical applications of microdosing. Um, there's a number of people that have successfully used it to replace their SSRIs. Even after 20 years of using antidepressants, they're finding relief using psilocybin. And I mean, so that's why I put up there, you know, welcome to the experiment, because we're sort of at the collective point of the spear moving into this new culture together. And it's really interesting to observe, particularly from a documentary standpoint, just looking at how it's working, who it's working for and why, and why people are using it. And there's so many amazing healing stories coming out of this grand experiment. So as of 2022, there are over 60 clinical trials researching the therapeutic effects of psilocybin in the United States. Uh, while short-term effects have been acknowledged, the long-term efficacy and safety of psilocybin therapy is yet to be determined due to the most trials being ongoing. However, preliminary results indicate that psilocybin therapy is efficacious in treating depression, smoking cessation, alcohol use disorder, and obsessive compulsive disorder. In some cases, people are taking like a heroic dose of a pure psilocybin extract, a single dose and getting off of alcohol or off of heroin or off of cigarettes or curing their depression, this major depressive disorder, which is just unheard of uh, in, in drug therapy. You know, a single dose of anything working for a long time, it's just amazing. Um, so, I mean, I have a lot of hope for this. I think culturally, we're gonna have a lot to work out to make it work for the people who need it. And right now what's happening in Colorado is that, and I've talked to a lot of experts on this, uh, particularly in the last couple of months since the bill has passed, that it's gonna be, we're in this sort of gray area right now, trying to figure out how to make it work, but nobody really knows what's going on. and you know, the, as a community of people that might or may not be interested in psilocybin as a conventional therapy, um, we need to support each other and build community around this and make sure that people who are interested in it have access to the resources and the information to make informed decisions about using it and whether or not it's right for them. Whew, okay. Mushrooms versus mycelium. This is a huge debate. Now we're gonna get into uh, like product stuff with mushrooms. Uh, and, you know, I'm only gonna really be able to scratch the surface here in the way that I have with these other topics. So obviously mushrooms are the fruits of the organism. There's no substrate contained within the fruit. Uh, they contain more beta-glucans compared to the my mycelium. Uh, they have a different set of chemical constituents. They contain spores in some cases. And the vast, vast majority of the research done in medicinal mushrooms is done on the fruit body. One argument against uh, mushrooms as being the more efficacious is that they represent the end of the organism's life, life cycle. That they are here today, gone tomorrow, that they are basically on their way out, and thus the mycelium is better. 
I don't really believe that though. So. Well, that's weird. The picture's gone. There's a mushroom there. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, um, gosh, I wonder if this is like an old file. Anyway, um, mycelium. So mycelium, for those of you that don't know, this is the main body of the organism. Uh, this is the network of sort of thread-like cells that exist most everywhere under our feet. And the mycelium uh, then creates these kinds of nodes where the fruits pin and emerge from these nodes. And mushrooms uh, reproduce not only through mycelium spreading, but also through spores uh, on animals and in the wind and that kind of thing. So, uh, yeah, so the, the main thing is that mycelium needs a substrate to grow on. It, can't, it can exist in water and the water and the sugars and the nutrients within the water can act as the substrate, um, but mostly it's, it's grown on grain or wood. And what this matters because in commercial mushroom farming, um, it, it, it means that the mycelium only makes up about 25% of the mass and 75% of that mass is the substrate, the grain or the wood. Uh, it has a different set of chemical constituents. As I said before, it's actually very, very low in beta-glucans. On average, it's somewhere between one and 3% across the primary medicinal mushroom strains. Um, but then in some rare cases, it has higher concentrations of these survival compounds that are antifungal and antiviral. Um, basically those compounds that give it uh, an edge in competing in its environment. And so those are the active compounds that we're looking for in our medicines. So it's much less expensive to cultivate. And basically you're removing an entire step in the cultivation process by not allowing it to fruit. Thus you have a cheaper uh, cultivation process. Um, Contrary to what you may see being advertised, mycelium products are not mushroom products. And this is easy for us mushroom people to understand, but it gets really difficult for non-mushroom people to understand. And the other thing that uh, is argued that makes it better is uh, that it is the it is the start and the primary portion of the life cycle. Like mycelium never really goes away. Like it can go dormant and it can die. It can run out of substrate and all that, but it can also live indefinitely if the conditions are right, which is, you know, in stark contrast to the fruit bodies that uh, go away really quickly. Uh, so whole powders. So this is basically taking either the fruit body or the mycelium or both and grinding it up into a powder. Many, many products on the market are just this. Why does this matter? Well, because it contains chitin. It is primarily chitin, which means you take a supplement that's just mushroom powder and it's going to go right through you. You're gonna get very, very, very little of the, of the medicinal benefits by taking just mushroom powder. At the very least, you have to cook it in order to make it digestible, in order to make it bioavailable. Uh, one of the benefits to this is that it contains spores. Uh, but again, those spores have to be cracked in order to access those beneficial compounds. Um, again, it's got the prebiotic fiber. That's pretty much the only thing that mushroom powder has going for it. Um, but it's non-soluble powder. So if you're going to put it in your coffee, uh, you're going to get a layer of mud in the bottom because it's not going to dissolve into your beverage. So anything that claim, anything that says it has powder in it, is you got you got to look out for that. I'm not gonna say don't buy it because if you're like a meat eater that never has vegetables, <laughs> then eating mushroom powder is actually pretty good for you because of all that prebiotic fiber, if you cook it. 
So extract powders. Bioavailability, that's the huge thing, right? That's like breaking the cell wall, accessing those beta glucans, those polysaccharides, all the good stuff that's hiding in the cell, you can then access if you pressure cook it or if you use alcohol. Each strain has a different set of parameters to get the best extraction possible. In temperature, timing, how many times you run the material through the extraction process. Um, water is gonna give you primarily like a beta-glucan content specification or a polysaccharide specification. Alcohol will give you the diterpenes and the triterpenes for the most part. Um, these are still fiber, but they are soluble fibers. So you can access them better and you can use them better in your preparations in terms of coffees, smoothies, whatever. Um, one thing to look out for on products is ratios. You might see a product that says it's four to one or one to one or 50 to one or 100 to one. This is crazy. Um, the ratio is not an expression of its potency. This is an expression of its material concentration. And mushroom extracts are not made to be concentrated. They are, the extraction process is designed to target specific active compounds, which has no bearing on the ratio, the concentration of it. So just because if it truly was a 100 to one extract doesn't mean it's gonna have the compounds that you want in there, that you're going after. So for example, uh, one of you know, the highest concentrated ratios of my dual extracts, meaning hot water and alcohol extracts is approximately 30 to 36 to one at the highest. These are the most potent medicinal grade extracts available on the market. Uh, and so beware, just beware of claims around ratios. This is something weird that happens in the West. This is primarily only seen in the US, Canada and Europe where like everybody wants to know like, well, what's your ratio? I'm like, it doesn't matter. I spend a lot of time explaining that it doesn't matter. Uh, Maltodextrin, there's a lot of fear around maltodextrin. It's fairly inert sugar that's used to prevent these high potency extracts from clumping up. So basically if you have these high potency powders without a, uh, another powder inside, it will ultimately clump up and then turn into resin. And this, depending on the humidity in your area, changes how long this actually takes. However, maltodextrin can be dangerous at high levels. I read a research paper that was like seven grams per kilogram of body weight is where it starts to make you feel gross, like tummy aches and stuff like that, which is a, a lot, a lot of maltodextrin. But look out for it. Like it should be labeled. Many times it is not. Um, the better powder used to prevent these high potency extracts from clumping up is just unextracted mushroom powder. It performs the same task and you're getting that fiber from, from the powder and it's not maltodextrin, which is nice. So, uh, let's see, this is a shot of the chaga extract. So tinctures, tinctures, a lot of tinctures in America. Um, I make this agaricon extract. This is the only tincture that I provide, um, primarily because the agaricon is so precious. And the benefits to a tincture is that it has a long shelf life. Um, it's a really easy delivery mechanism for most people. Just whoop, whoop, nice and there it goes. Um, you can really make good tinctures in your kitchen. You don't need fancy equipment to make good quality tinctures. However, they are fairly low potency. So 
for example, if you take uh, one of one of these extract powders that I use, that I produce, it's like we made a tincture and then we evaporated all the alcohol. And so we're left with just the residue that the alcohol was carrying. So you remove the delivery mechanism and you get way more bang for your buck and it's fully bioavailable. And the other problem is they're really expensive to manage. You know, shipping alcohol is heavily, heavily regulated, super expensive. Good alcohol is expensive. So these are just kind of setbacks in order to producing a really high quality product that's also cost effective and affordable for people who need the medicine. Um, but this is mostly what we see in the US. We either are seeing myceliated grain products, mushroom powders, or tinctures. Um, but you know there is a time and a place for tinctures. I'm not poo-pooing them entirely. And um, you know, for people who are making medicine at home, this is a good way to sort of introduce um, medicine into your life and making it yourself. So this is a recipe for one of my favorite ways to make an extract. I make these, I use this method for myself. This is from Christopher Hobbs, who wrote uh, one of the books I had up there called, uh, it's called Medicinal Mushrooms, The Essential Guide. I highly recommend it. it's a fantastic book. Uh, so you can take any mushroom. You know what? I'll just play the video. This is like two minutes. You know, you save them for special occasions and then you just never eat them. Oh man, it smelled so bad. actually took like, I don't know, 35 hours to dehydrate because I made them too thick. This is this is one of these like pretty high power grinders. And then the powder itself smelled really, really good. And the, the what's awesome about this is that you you get really the whole mushroom in this process you get all those active compounds you get all the fiber nothing's nothing's missing from this and you could take it a step further and do an alcohol extraction on it at some step in there and use that same material um, and then you know then you would have a, a dual extract now that depends on which which mushrooms you're you're using to make it Oh, you know what? I think this might be an old file. Shoot. Oh, well. Uh, so a lot of uh, demystifying required for Chinese mushrooms. Um, oh, man, where do you begin? OK, so a lot of rumors around the Chinese mushroom industry 
uh, like, you know, that they contain pollutants, that they're low quality, the factory farming, they use fillers, it cannot be trusted. But in my experience of working in across American and Chinese mushroom industry, this really boils down to a kind of xenophobia that we were raised, at least my generation was raised that anything from China is cheap and it breaks and it's plastic. And this is just patently untrue when it comes to mushrooms. And on the other hand, we have this idea about American exceptionalism, which just doesn't exist in our mushroom industry. We are literally millennia behind the Chinese culturally and socially and technologically when it comes to growing mushrooms, extracting mushrooms, and having a culture that accepts mushrooms in, as a part of our regular diet. And so one of the common rumors around um, like polluted Chinese mushrooms is that they're absorbing toxins through the air pollution. Um, and the truth is Chinese mushroom farms are primarily in rural areas, very far away from urban centers. And they, they exist regionally, like they exist where specific species will grow the best. So there's like an area where reishis are grown because the conditions and the environment in that area are best suited to reishi. It's the same for shiitake and the black wood ear. And um, there's like two villages that grow exclusively lion's mane mushrooms. And those are primarily produced in uh, indoors as well as cordyceps. Like the farms that do exist in urban areas are indoor farms where they are heavily protected through HEPA filters in order to just be able to grow the mushrooms. So this idea that air pollution is affecting the mushrooms is just kind of ridiculous if you take a minute to think about what's required to grow mushrooms, um, which you know contamination is the primary factor in keeping your mushrooms clean. They won't grow if they're covered in trichoderma. Um, low quality, you know, what does that even mean, right? Like, <laughs> um, you know, is it filled with maltodextrin? Maybe. <laughs> there are mushroom brands in America that use 90% maltodextrin because they don't even know that the maltodextrin is in their product. That they're told, oh, this is mushrooms and the company that's buying them is just accepting that, which is just kind of bonkers. Uh, factory farming. Yes, there are large farms that exist in China, but not the way that you would imagine like a box store that we have here. It's not like that. There are thousands of farms distributed across China and there's no monopoly on the mushroom growing. This comes from a very rich and long culture of growing mushrooms and, and they're just widely distributed that like anybody with enough low amount of capital can start a mushroom farm there and have everything they need to, to make it happen. And it's a good business. China produces 95% of the world's mushrooms and consumes 85% of the world's mushrooms. Like the American mushroom industry barely even registers. Um, like any big industry, multi-billion dollar industry, there are bad actors. It just goes with the territory of any industry. Uh, and so like knowing your sources is really critical to having a good product across the board. And American industry is no exception to that as well. We have crappy producers of everything just like any other industry would have low quality production or actors within that industry that produce low quality things. So China is not immune to that either in their mushroom industry, but there are good actors producing high quality products. Oh yeah, how did I do the wrong file? Yeah, I don't know if you can read that, but this sort of sums up the attitude around 
nationalism within an industry, in my opinion. This is my opinion, of course. This does not reflect the opinions of this club. <laughs> um, but, you know, okay, so let's talk about US mushrooms. We basically grow agaricus bisporus. Those are where, that's where our massive production is. And we truly do grow them in, in factory farms, like monocropping massive amounts of white button mushrooms. Um, now that's changing slowly, slowly. We have a lot of smaller producers uh, all across the country producing more varieties of edible mushrooms, uh, medicinal mushrooms. Uh, but we're not even close to being able to produce the sheer kilos required to make high potency extract powders. That's why our industry is primarily focused on tinctures and unextracted powders and myceliated grains, because these are significantly economically more viable to produce in America. So we're babies in this industry for the most part, and that's changing and it's beautiful to watch. There's a lot of investment going into new mushroom companies, um, but really we have a lot of catching up to do if we're gonna compete on the global scale or be able to produce uh, high quality products that can compete with the Chinese market. Uh, and frankly, it's a long road ahead of us because there isn't the economic demand. There's a very small number of people that are eating mushrooms regularly uh, or using mushroom medicine regularly. It's just not integrated into our culture. We, we emerged from a fungophobic culture thanks to the British and we haven't fully transcended that. A lot of people will be like, oh, you eat mushrooms? What are you high now? You know, that's the common attitude and it's really unfortunate but that's just the nature of our culture. Um, so this is like, in order to compete, the larger American mushroom brands basically do everything they can to uh, discredit Chinese mushrooms. This is standard marketing procedure. Um, even the most, the biggest trusted brands in America, um, will will poo poo any mushroom that comes from China and make up stories about why it's bad and what who not to trust. Um, even even I've heard, I'm not going to name names, but I've heard people even try and discredit the medicinal effic efficacy of beta glucans because there's very few beta glucans in myceliated grain versus the fruit bodies. And so it's just an attempt to try and make uh, one product look better than the other for the most part. Um, and, you know, I don't know if we'll ever get over this. I think this is just the nature of free market capitalism um, and the nature of marketing in general is to, you know, how do you make your product rise above the rest? You know, what's your added value or, or whatever? But I really hope that, you know, at least through my work, through my filmmaking, through talks like these, we can demystify the mushroom industry a little bit. And then people can make their own choices about what kind of mushroom products they want to consume. So one of the big things to understand um, that like, if, if, if the company you're buying mushrooms from isn't doing their own testing, then you should demand that they do. Uh, this is critical for any, any supplement industry, any medicinal product should be tested. Uh, this is a uh, certificate of analysis from uh, Domo Nunzio who runs the Magic Myco fam. He started the Cultivar Cup. This is showing the um, active alkaloid content of a test he did between psilocybe caps and um, psilocybe stems from one flush. And there's, I don't know if you can see it pretty, there's quite a lot of variability in the potency between caps and stems 
uh, even in the same flush. Um, and that just goes to illustrate that there is very little consistency in terms of what's inside one mushroom versus what's inside the mushroom growing right next to it. So what we test for primarily is agricultural chemicals. So that includes pesticides, herbicides, fungicides. Uh, we test for heavy metals. We test for molds. Uh, we can test for fillers, uh, primarily maltodextrin. That's the primary one used. That's a super easy test to test for starch in your product. You can use iodine, you can dilute your product in water, drop some iodine in it. And if it turns blue, there's starch in your product. Um, my products, basically I test my, my whole dried mushrooms as they come into the extraction facility. Then I test them when they leave the extraction facility. And then you can even take it further and test them once they arrive uh, in your fulfillment center or wherever you're storing your products. Um, so I do third-party testing at a lab called Eurofins and that tests for our beta-glucan content, our um, heavy metals, our molds. And I pay $200 per compound per strain per test. So on average, it's about $6,000 between the strains I use and, and the amount of tests that I need done for each one. So every batch can be up to $6,000 in testing. And if it doesn't pass any of those tests, it doesn't get shipped. And that can be um, prohibitively expensive for most small companies. Even big companies aren't doing this level of testing. Um, so you can ask for the certificates of analysis from your supplier and you should be able to get them. If they don't have their certificate of analysis, big red flag. So I'm part of an effort now to, I'm working with a couple of other uh, mushroom extract companies in order to create an American constituent test testing standard. And what that means is we want to create a stamp that we can put on our products that says we have verified 2% arinacine, 1% cordycepin, 30% um, beta-glucan, like whatever, whatever it is you're touting, you want to be able to run it through the gamut of tests. And then once it arrives in the US, do it again. But the problem is it's so freaking expensive. So we create a collective of brands, of growers, of extractors, anybody that has a vested interest in maintaining a high quality product, get our collective buying power together and lower the cost of these tests so that everybody in the collective can get this stamp on their product if their product earns it. And to me, this is absolutely essential for us uh, as an industry within this country to take the step further into having a consumer base that actually trusts these products. And that can be a product from anywhere. As long as it enters our testing protocol, you know, we can verify that it has what it claims to have. And in that way, creating a new standard of quality for mushroom products in the US, which does not exist yet. All right. <laughs> yeah, it's, we have a long road ahead. It's, it's, it's a big job. So this is what a certificate of analysis looks like. Uh, a lot of them are formatted this way. Uh, this is just an example of one of the dual extracts that I use. Uh, of note, you can take a look at um, the beta-glucan and hericinone arinacine content um, where the specific, oops, oh crap. Aye, aye, aye. Okay, um, this is where, so like basically we, we, we have a target specification for our extract, right? In this case, um, 
you know, the hair and hair and and aranaceans, we were look, we we're targeting 1.2%, which is already very high, but then it tested at 3.02%. So we're exceeding the target compound. Um, and then if you look down, we have the microbiological compounds, molds, yeasts, um, and then, you know, up here we have the contaminants like heavy metals. Now it's important to understand about heavy metals. All mushrooms bioaccumulate heavy metals to some degree. It's just the nature of how they exist in their environment. And so what's awesome about cultivating mushrooms is you can control the substrates in order to keep those heavy metals very, very low, which you, you don't have the benefit of doing with wild harvested mushrooms. Um, so, you know, we do in-house testing and then we send our, we send our mushrooms to Eurofins for a certain round of tests. And then we send it to another laboratory called Intertech that primarily does all the agricultural chemicals. Standard good practice is for your co-packer to test something when it comes into their facility so that if it comes out contaminated, they can point to where the contamination happened. But this almost never happens in our industry, in our co-packing industry. Um, and the way we keep track of that is batch numbers for the most part. But if you're using a co-pack, like you better demand that they do testing because if there's anything wrong with your product, it's on them to make sure that everything in their facility is clean. Um, I've had products, I've had particularly around turkey tail, come in to uh, the extraction facility and test clean. And then when they are finished doing the extraction process, they test positive for, you know, a pesticide or something like that. And this is a major bummer, right? Because at some point in the process, it got contaminated. And so this forces us to do uh, better practices across the board. Um, let's see. So, in conclusion, many and varied uses of active compounds. We're just just learning about this active compounds in mushrooms. We're constantly discovering. Not only are we discovering new mushrooms all the time. Once we start looking at what's in those mushrooms. We're learning new things about it all the time. This paper that was released by uh, Juliana Furci and Stamets and a bunch of other authors recently about the Psilocybe genus basically concluded that we know nothing about the Psilocybe genus, <laughs> which was just like a shocker for people in that scene. Um, but it, it illustrates that we have a lot to learn. Like whatever we think we know, we definitely don't know what we don't know. And it's difficult to understand that and appreciate that when you're constantly lost in the research and looking you know, with a magnifying glass at every little detail because there's much wider pictures going on. Um, we're, the mushrooms that I listed up here are just a handful. I think there were seven or eight, maybe nine mushrooms, but really like most of the wild, delicious edible mushrooms that we hunt every year are also medicinal. There's all kinds of cool, cool compounds that we're finding in these mushrooms, like honey mushrooms, uh, porcinis, morels, um, armillaria. Oh, sorry, I just said that. Um, uh, the the uh, hawks wings, corals, um, enoki. I mean, all of our mushrooms have active compounds in them, but these are not, you know, commercial medicinal mushrooms. Where basically, the industry is sticking to the few. Uh, that I've talked about, uh, but everything is medicinal as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> um, you know, when you're buying a product, look at the label. What 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 claims are they making on there? It, are they are they talking about their beta glucan content? Um, are they talking about their diterpenes or their triterpenes? You know, these are really fundamental in the mushroom products that are available now. So you have to look out for that stuff. Beware of high extraction ratios. Um, if you're not sure, call the company, ask them, where's your COA? Let me see your test results. That's all legit. 
If you want to know, they should be able to provide it. If they can't, red flag. Um, yeah, so go outside, look for your own medicine, learn about it. I think that's really the best thing we can do for ourselves, our minds, our bodies. You know, participate in your own wellness, and then you're more you're more active in the healing process. So that's my website, hamiltonsmushrooms.com. Um, I do wholesale to other brands. My idea is basically to get all the new up and coming brands, the best possible cleanest mushroom extracts available to elevate the whole industry within the US. This is really, really important that we start eliminating shitty products. Uh, my direct to consumer product is there. That's the body blend. Um, please uh, pay attention to the Bayul mushroom retreat, August 9th to the 13th, if you're interested. Uh, this is like an in-depth uh, retreat, you know, forest to table meals, guided forays, presentations from American and international top mycologists. Last year we had David Aurora, Christopher Hobbs, and Peter McCoy come and present. In October, we're gonna do the French Alps foray uh, where we do guided forays. This is more of like a mushrooms foraging 101 course in France with amazing chefs. Um, and please follow me, watch my films. I'm on most of the platforms. Um, my films are all free on YouTube. My latest film is available video on demand uh, on, um, it's about psilocybe azure essence. And, uh, you know, I'm really interested in building community around mushrooms all the time, particularly around storytelling, medicine, retreats, events, festivals, whatever, whatever. I'm into it. I'm into it. I want to talk to you all. I want to know you guys. I'm down for collaborating. Um, I, it's just, you're my people. <laughs> um, and, you know, like, thank you so much. And I don't know if we have much time left for questions, but I'm ready to take them now. Oh, yes, yes. I forgot to mention, uh, we just started the Western Colorado Mycological Association based out of Carbondale. And, you know, if you know anyone in the Western Slope, tell them to look us up. We're a brand new fresh mushroom club, and uh, we'd be happy to have you. And this is to scan my, this is for my website. You can sign up for my email list, basically to stay up to date on all the things I'm doing, right? I've tons of films. My, I've got a bunch of films like cooking right now. Um, I've got products on the back table over there. If you're interested, I'd be happy to uh, sell you mushroom extracts and there's free stickers there. Um, one of the cool projects I'm working on is the Cold Fire Project with D Jeff Ravage. And, the, and Dr. Lauren Chaplicki, who co-authored his paper, which is using fungi to uh, mitigate fires in the forest. We call it cold fire because fungal degradation help, like basically does the same thing as firewood in a natural environment. And uh, Jeff Ravage is here tonight. His book is available in the back there. Please reach out to him. He's doing amazing work around the cold fire project. And I'm really excited about the potential of the Cold Fire Project because uh, it has the potential to transform the West by basically accelerating the decomposition of the deadfall and the burn fuels and creating uh, more um, ancient forest structures. And um, if you have questions about that, talk to Jeff, he's in the back. And I'm happy to take some questions. Yeah, Greg. Oh, cool. Uh,